we're going to give it a few minutes. We have a packed house tonight. This is standing room only, standing Zoom only tonight for this presentation. We're going to give it a few minutes. We are at 450 folks on the webinar already. Unbelievable. Welcome. Uh, we're going to give it a few minutes for people to uh, finish up their dinners and whatnot. If you, what I, one thing I love to do, let me know in the chat where you're coming on from, where you are coming in from. Everyone is muted. Um, we can't see you, but you can type in the chat uh, where you're coming from. You can say hello, Quincy. Oh my goodness, I can't even keep up with it already. Holy moly. It's on Arizona, Tucson, Arizona in the house. Rhode Island, Minnesota. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Lots of Maine, Kennebunk, Westbrook, Vermont. Oh, someone all the way from Rome? Rome, Rome Italy or Rome, Maine? Ah, <laughs> I busted me on it. Welcome, everyone, up over 500 already for this webinar about the most famous bird that's ever been in Maine, perhaps. Um, Bogota, Colombia. I'll say it now while we're waiting. I'll say it again once we get started. But... Uh, chats in the chat and then questions. We're gonna have a question and answer portion at the end of this. Put those down in the Q&A box uh, down below. That's where those will go. We're gonna save them for the end, um, but chat it up now. Found with Maine, Virginia, welcome. So we'll give it, uh, it's 6.32. We'll give it to, I think 34 or so before we get started. It's going to be as crowded as a wharf in Georgetown. In the, <laughs> in the <Zoom. laughs> Very good. Welcome, everyone. Stellar sea eagle time. I'm excited. Doug, how are you feeling? I thought we were doing a Groundhog's Day talk. Oops. Did I uh, did put I down that PowerPoint? Get another one. <laughs> Here we go. North Yarmouth, Michael Boardman in the house. Let me plug Michael Boardman's art. I, his shirt came in the mail the other day. It's beautiful. He made a beautiful Stellar Sea Eagle shirt. Uh, I got a size too small because I've been in pandemic and I haven't been exercising. So I need to buy a larger shirt, but it's beautiful and I love it. Uh, Coyote, is it Coyote Graphics? What's the website off the top of my head? I'm sorry, Michael. Coyote Graphics. Coyote. Coyote. All right, Coyote, somebody put it in, two E. Oh, Coyote, I never put that together. Carabasset Valley, Maine, welcome. My brother's up there. All right, I'm gonna give it one more minute. We are at 560 folks joining. This is the largest, uh, the lar I, 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 Michael, I'm gonna sell it on the secondary market. I think I'm gonna uh, get some more for my, for the shirt. Um, this is going to be great. Welcome. We're going to get started in just a second talking about the Stellar Sea Eagle, the joyous experience, the, really the only good thing that's happened in the past two years, I think, speaking personally. Here's Doug's desktop. And here's oh, Doug, you're on a weird um, presenter view thingy. That's not what I want. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing great here. Everyone. Having fun. Hey, this is all about having fun tonight. Lafayette, California. There it is. Look at that. Yeah, let me plug quickly the Kudo board on mainautobahn.org where people can share their stories of coming up and seeing this bird. Uh, it's, a re it's a really cool place to scroll through. You see all these folks, 90 plus year old people who, who learned about stellar sea eagles when they were 12 years old and finally now when they're you know 80 years later are coming up and getting to see one in person it's pretty amazing let's uh let's do this thing let's get started hello everybody it is me nick lund from maine audubon advocacy and outreach manager from maine audubon i'm here with my friend and colleague doug hitchcock staff naturalist for maine audubon hey doug hello everyone uh hello. thrilled to be here I'm thrilled to be here too. It's a thrilling time. We are here, of course, to talk about the amazing ongoing question mark saga of the stellar sea eagle, the coolest bird I've ever seen in my life, a bird I never thought I'd see, a bird that has graced Maine and as you'll see, New North America with its 
unexpected presence. We're going to be talking all about it. Um, but first, I'm going to go over a few uh, ground rules here. Again, we are in a webinar format. We can't see you or hear you. Um, so if you have chats, put them in the old chat. That's what we've been doing. Thanks for putting your towns in there. If you have questions, we're going to save all the questions for the end. So if you, ha if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box. You'll see that also down below the two speech bubbles there. Um, put them in there. We'll get to them at the end, and we'll, we'll wade through it. Um, we have a, uh, a donate link down there at the bottom, mainaudubon.org slash donate. Thank you to the, all, all the people who donated already uh, before joining. This is so great. Uh, Main Audubon, of course, uh, relies on uh, donations and uh, you know to be able to put on free programming like this. Thank you so much. And let's get started. I'm going to turn it over to Doug. We got a full slate of things to talk about. So I'm going to turn it over to Doug. He's going to talk about this incredible species. Yeah, Nick and I will do a little bit of back and forth here. Uh, and before we, you know, really talk about the the stellar sea eagles, uh, we thought it would be uh, fun, maybe important, to just talk about kind of stellar sea eagles as a, a species, give you a little bit of kind of a background and uh, a little bit about the natural history of them. So uh, major kudos to uh, Leslie Clapp for sharing these photos, because as Nick was saying just a minute ago, this is a species that, you know, people like think about uh, or want to see almost throughout like their whole lives. Uh, so Leslie shared these photos from a, a trip that um, that she took to Japan, which is where most people have to go to see them. So the next few uh, will be from that. I did think it'd be helpful to uh, share this map, um, essentially showing the range of where these should go. I realize I, I lost the key here, but our more reddish orange color in the top is to designate their more summer range. Getting down into the purple is where you can find them year round. And then blue showing the extent of their winter range. So the distribution of our, <laughs> our typical Stellar's sea eagles. Um, I had to look up the, the pronunciation of this. Ah, uh, Kosek is the, uh, the sea that they're, they're basically around here down into the Sea of Japan. But so as you can see, as we said, um, for most people, you know, if you want to see a stellar seagull, it's going to someplace like Japan, uh, maybe up to, uh, excuse me, Hokkaido, if I can get my uh, geography right here. Otherwise, East Russia, you know, is, is where a lot of them are going to be breeding, the Kamchatka Peninsula. Um, these are really tough areas to get to. And as I like to say, you know, for many birders, we, we like to see as many species of birds as we can see, but this takes such a dedicated trip, even if you're in Japan in the winter, you know, sometimes it requires doing things like going out on boat trips. Before I leave this map, the thing that I wanted to point out is um, uh, looking at the, the, essentially the latitude of this map, focusing on this winter range, this kind of blue, I guess getting up into uh, the purple where they're year round, is essentially from uh, 30, excuse me, 37 to 51 degrees north, a pretty, uh, pretty good stretch. Remember between 37 and 51, if we were to, and we'll do this in a minute, look at a map of uh, Maine and we'll pick Booth Bay where the bird's been seen, that's right at 43 degrees north, um, pretty much right in the middle of this range. So we'll talk about this a, a little bit throughout the night. Um, that the bird is essentially at home here. It's, you know, not that it's all just about uh, <laughs> how far north it is, uh, but you can see that we're in a pretty similar area. Another thing that's really helpful is having food around. Uh, and we certainly know that that's a key reason why uh, the stellar sea eagle seems to be doing so well in that kind of mid coast, greater Booth Bay area, uh, catching plenty of things like fish. Again, absolutely stunning photos by uh, Leslie of these birds. Again, just to be clear, these are birds from uh, Japan. People are not, <laughs> no one's gotten this close to the stellar seagull um, as it's been in Maine, but um, fish are a huge part of their diet. Uh, what we've even seen here in Maine is uh, a little bit of aggression between the stellar seagull and our it's not often we refer to our bald eagles as being the smaller birds. 
Uh, we sometimes talk about bald eagles will steal fish from osprey, but the stellar sea eagles are, or the one, excuse me, has been seen even chasing after uh, the bald eagles around here. So, and what's known as kleptoparasitism, wonderful scrabble word, um, klepto stealing and parasite living off something else. So they're stealing the food of, of something else. Um, but that's a nice advantage when you've got uh, essentially that much mass or, or that much uh, size on your side. Also fun to see in this photo is a younger bird here on, on the left. Um, and good to note that you can, just like our bald eagles that take about five years to get their white head, otherwise they essentially start mostly dark. And as they age, they get the white head and white tail. Um, stellar sea eagles take, it's uh, less time, but it's still like three or four years to get that adult plumage, um, which is a fun fact about our, the bird here in Maine is a stunning adult. Another beautiful photo by Leslie. And what I really liked about this is you can see this remarkable shape to the tail. Uh, most of our raptors we think of as having a very, you know, kind of evenly length uh, tail feathers, but the stellar seagull has this really wedge-shaped tail, uh, which is quite remarkable. It's, uh, we don't see that on really any raptors. Of course, the, uh, those big white shoulders and that honking orange yellow bill. Um, and then just remarkable, uh, again, a, a sight you're not going to see in Maine, but to see uh, a collection of these birds, and this is especially remarkable just um, given that they are considered a uh, vulnerable species. So this is from BirdLife International. Their red list designation is uh, vulnerable. So within that kind of globally threatened group, I did think, you know, uh, we're, we're focusing on just this one individual here in Maine, uh, but important to kind of think about them. Uh, it's rare here, but it is also kind of globally rare too. Some estimates, uh, the upper range of estimates say that there's only about 5,000 individuals um, uh, out there in the wild. Uh, apparently some of the biggest problems for them are uh, essentially habitat conversion on their breeding grounds where they're losing a lot of development, uh, a lot of their grounds to development, things like hydroelectric power plants. Um, and then there's uh, a large scale uh, coastal and offshore development of petrochemicals uh, um, of that industry. So uh, some of the areas that they're going to be going to are essentially just starting to be lost. Interestingly, to compare our, the stellar sea eagles to the bald eagles uh, that we have here, another uh, big cause of mortality for them is uh, from lead poisoning. So the use of lead shot, which is typically um, I'll encourage folks to follow uh, Avian Haven, one of the great rehabbers uh, in the state of Maine. Um, and they often, uh, very unfortunately, uh, share the story of how so many of our bald eagles in Maine end up with uh, lead poisoning, presumably all from shot. Um, they're definitely uh, at risk from, from climate change, especially if you just think about the region and uh, the area that they're in. And a, a, a fascinating thing I read earlier today was that um, in a specific area, uh, uh, I believe it's, it's pronounced uh, Sakhalin Island, um, the biggest problem for them is predation from uh, brown bears. Their nestlings are <laughs> just, I guess, taken down by, uh, by brown bears, which um, not a, a predator you often um, think about, but with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen for a second and, and let Nick kind of give us the story of this one very uh, special stellar seed. Yeah, there you go, I gotta unmute myself. Uh, I will tell you that story and what a story it is. This, this eagle, every time I think about this or talk about this, I just get a big smile on my face because this is a cool story. Um, I want to thank Leslie Clapp again for those early photos. I want to point out that this photo is from Zach Holderby, another member of Down East Audubon. Thank you hint to Zach for his amazing photos. Um, and let's get into it. So, you know, I, as a birder, I learned about stellar sea eagles, I think from David Attenborough in Life of Birds, BBC series, the stellar sea eagle. 
is this incredible bird. I never thought I would see it, right? I, I don't plan, I don't, Siberia is not high on my list of places to go. Always wanted to see it, never thought I would um, until, until now. Here is where everything got started. Sunday, August 30th, 2020, the, uh, the birding, the news of the birding world is, is titillated by this report from a birder, Josh Parks on the Denali Highway in, the, in central Alaska. He said, I was driving along and I saw this stellar sea eagle sitting on a tree. Um, pretty incredible, no doubt about the identification. He got some great photographs. Um, and this was really interesting, although this was very far away from most of us. Um, this is an exciting sighting. Um, anytime that there's a stellar sea eagle in the United States, it's pretty amazing. And there have been sightings before, right? Here is an eBird map of stellar sea eagle sightings. Um, you see uh, uh, Russia over there on the left and then Alaska. You see there are a couple isolated spots uh, through the Aleutians, uh, you know, up south of Anchorage and then down in the Juneau area that was there for a while. Um, the, the spot north of Anchorage, that's where Josh Park saw this bird. And that was noteworthy for a lot of folks because that is by far the furthest from the sea that a stellar sea eagle had ever been seen. So that was interesting. Everybody sort of raised their eyebrows, um, but that was it. Um, uh, I wanna point out something quickly too. Here is one of the flight photos that Josh was able to get. Look at this just awesome looking bird. Um, big bird and one thing to keep in mind as we go forward is the white patch on the coverts there as it transitions into the dark uh, flight feathers. You'll see that um, each individual sea eagle has a slightly different pattern um, and slightly sort of unique, um, you know, pattern and feathering as it goes in. If you look here, just keep an eye on a few things here. We see the white up front. You see this sort of isolated white patch down here. And we see this maybe elongated white feather in here. So just keep that in mind as you go forward. So like I said, uh, August 2020, that was pretty cool, but then it disappeared. This is what we call a one day wonder seen by Josh and Josh only. Uh, this is my little SpongeBob nine months later slide. Nine months later, we're all in the middle of the pandemic, not having fun. This bad boy pops up. March 10th, 2021, a, the Barnhart Q5 Ranch and Nature Retreat post a picture on their Facebook page of a stellar sea eagle in, we're in Texas. We are in Texas. Um, they said a rare bird sighting today at Kalido Creek, which is a place near, near the ranch. Um, a stellar sea eagle all the way from Russia. And let me tell you, this was pretty wild. Uh, birders did not know what to think of this. Um, was this an escaped bird? Was this the same? Was this a bird? Did this bird get here on its own? Nobody knew. This is so far out of the normal range of a stellar sea eagle that nobody knew what to do. Um, photographs were taken. Uh, people uh, later went on a boat and they found uh, the, this exact uh, log that it was perched on. So it was proving that at least this, this photo was taken in Texas. It wasn't sort of miscaptioned, uh, but nobody saw it again. This was the only photo that was taken. There were no open wing shots, um, but uh, um, that was pretty crazy. Um, and you can see down there just um, between, you know, south of San Antonio and Houston is where this bird was. Um, it, uh, you know, spoiler alert, this was later determined to be the same bird. How the heck did it get from Alaska to Texas? Nobody has any idea. Um, I scribbled some arrows here. Did it go all the way across Canada and come down over the Midwest? Did it fly over the Rocky Mountains? Did it skirt the California highways down along the water? Nobody knows. Nobody saw it in between then. This gigantic eagle, the largest eagle in the world, flew from central Alaska all the way down to southern Texas without being seen by anybody. Nobody knows where it was for that nine months. Uh, nobody knows what it was doing. I love that. I love thinking about that. I love, I love some guy in Wyoming sleeping and a sea eagle is like perched over his house at night. He, he never even knew about it. It's pretty crazy. No one has it, any idea where it went. We never will know how it got to Texas. Uh, what happened next? Well, it showed up somewhere else. It showed up in New Brunswick and Quebec, the Restigouche River um, down here. So you look at this map too, June 8th, 28th 
of 2021, three months later after the Texas bird. Um, this bird was spotted again um, down here. And we're looking at the lower of these three dots here on the Gaspé Peninsula. Um, it was spotted, there it was. And uh, uh, folks, uh, not many people uh, were able to see this bird. It was around and it moved around a lot. Actually between um, late June and early August, it was spotted sort of um, the, between the rightmost two, the eastern uh, most of these dots on this map. Um, it was spotted there back and forth. So it would fly um, uh, fairly frequently between those two dots, it's like hundreds of miles. Um, it was the last sighting was on the um, the dot up there on the St. Lawrence River uh, in early August. Um, it was seen there. So it was flying all over Gas Bay this summer. And guess what? So folks did get shots of this. And they were able to determine very clearly, very easily that this was the same individual bird. And so um, we see here some photos. The photo on the left is the uh, is a photo of the bird uh, on the Restigouche River in uh, on the border of New Brunswick and Quebec. And then the photo in the middle is the photo from Josh Parks from Alaska that we showed earlier. And you can see, you can see the little white spot down below. You can see the um, intruding uh, white feather up on the, uh, on the top wing there. So it was very clear and obvious it's the same bird. I put the rightmost picture in to show you that not all birds have the same uh, pattern, right? You can see that bird doesn't have those sort of sharp intrusions. That's a completely different bird. What this photo I took from somewhere. Um, and so you can see that that um, it's sort of a fingerprint that we are able to determine. So um, so it, it was on. So people are now piecing it together with, you know, definitely that this uh, more than a year later, um, this bird is still traveling around North America, which meant a lot of things. It's meant it's feeding. It's it's doing fine. The bird looked healthy and is flying around. This bird is uh, living. It's 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 fending for itself and it's making a wave. Again, how did it get from Texas to Quebec? Nobody knows. There are a lot of birders between Texas and Quebec. There are a lot of people, and not one of them, not one of us. I include us because it could have flown right over us in Maine. Not one of us saw it. Nobody knows where it went. Did it go up through Minnesota? Did it go just straight shot over Cleveland? Did it go down through Florida? Nobody knows. We'll never know. Um, I, I think it's very cool to figure that out. What happened then? So that was uh, early August, two months later, right? August, September, three months later in November, um, showed up in Nova Scotia, Falmouth, Nova Scotia. Uh, my buddy Jake Walker was among the folks who saw it um, there in Nova Scotia. This again was a one day wonder. Um, and let me tell you, as a birder, uh, during the pandemic, when the border between Canada and the US was closed, um, this was a tough time because in any other circumstances, Doug probably would have texted first and we all would have got in the car and just driven through the night up to Gas Bay or to Falmouth, Nova Scotia or to anywhere this bird was. This is one of, this is a rarity of all rarities, but we were all just sitting on our hands looking at the eBird reports because we couldn't do anything about uh, getting to the stellar sea eagle. So again, to recap, this is where this bird has flown. It flew, we know for a fact that it went to Texas it went all the way up to Quebec. It went down to Nova Scotia. This bird is cranking around. So this is where sort of uh, I get into the story. I, I, I have had sort of a weird role. Uh, look, I'm not tooting my own horn, but I'm, I'm going to just toot, toot it a little bit. I tweeted from my account, hey, this is crazy. Someone from a major outlet needs to write about this seller seagull. This is, uh, it's, we know it's gone from Alaska. It wasn't confirmed at Texas at that point. It's been accepted by the Texas Bird Records Committee since then. Somebody needs to talk about this. We're sick of NFTs. Somebody write about it. The a little paper called the New York Times uh, emailed me after that. We they we set up a story. They wrote about the story. So the first sort of national press about the Seller Seagull uh, was in the New York Times, and sort of um, that's when a lot of people sort of first may have heard of it. Uh, but then again, disappeared. Right. So that was November third, twenty twenty one, and it was gone until a a faithful couple days for Doug and I at least. Um, December 12th, this message came across the, um, the Massachusetts bird listserv. He said, there is the record of a, a stellar seagull along the Taunton River in Massachusetts, southern Massachusetts. Um, this was, uh, it, it was first seen on the 12th 
but word word did not get out. You can see the date up here. This message was sent on the 19th. So a week it was on the Taunton River that um, the public did not know about it. I'm not exactly sure how word ended up getting out, but, but get out it did. And so we all uh, on the 19th uh, went to sleep going, holy moly, I hope this bird is still on the river. Um, the December 20th, uh, Doug and I, uh, we're doing a Christmas bird count in York County. Shout out to York County, Bill Graben. I know you're on there somewhere. Um, the, we were doing a Christmas bird count when we got confirmation that the stellar seagull was still there. It was down, uh, it, it, the Somerset boat ramp reported there. Doug and I and Finn and uh, Ed Jenkins who's not in the picture. We said, sorry, York County, we'll count your birds later, but we are out of here. We said, I would have ditched my wedding had I been in the wedding. I said, we gotta go. We jumped in the car, we drove two and a half hours and we saw a bird I never thought I would see in my entire life. The largest eagle in the world, the coolest looking bird, maybe on earth, a stellar eagle. Um, this is the picture I took with my phone through Doug's scope. This is the only position we saw the bird in the whole time. It was perched. Um, those are bald eagles behind it. The, the photo is a little misleading. Those, those eagles are, um, you know, they're a little bit behind it, so they look maybe smaller, but you can see how much bigger this bird is than bald eagles. Bald eagles are the biggest birds that, you know, that we have. You see bald eagle, you're impressed. This bird was honking huge. So we had a great time, high-fived, took a few shots of Russian vodka, and we got home in celebration, and um, uh, we're generally very excited. Word got out that this bird flew away uh, about an hour after we left and was not seen again in Massachusetts. And so that was that on, on December 20th. Then what happened? It was the end of the year and I was trying to get some more birds for my year list. I, my lovely wife gave me some time off and I was birding and I was not having good, I struck out on everything. And I was sitting in the back of an auto parking lot in Portland, a grimy place looking for a bird and it wasn't there. And I was feeling pretty depressed. I looked down at my phone and on my dumb old blogs, a woman named Linda Tharp had left a comment that says, uh, I had written a blog post about the Stellar Seagull in Massachusetts. And she said, it's in five islands today. And I said, interesting. I wasn't doing anything, I was sitting in my car. So I just Googled, I looked for Linda Tharp. I found her Instagram and I sent her a message and she responded right away. And I said, do you have any photos? And she said, yes. And she sent me this. And I said, um. And I said, that's, you know, this isn't, this isn't the cover of National Geographic, but there aren't any birds that look like that. That's a big old bird. That's not a juvenile bald eagle with a pattern like that. I did what we do, which is I texted my friends. Uh, I, I were on a, a friend's chat. I said, I didn't want to spoil anything. I said, what is it? And I went, Doug, I said, what does this look like to you? And when Doug texted that emoji back, I, it's on. I knew it was on. So um I, I immediately we drove up it was dusk it was about three i can't remember it, it was getting close to dusk by the time we got up to five islands a couple of us went there we didn't see anything um but we knew that this bird had come to maine so i'm gonna now turn it over to doug to talk about the last leg of the saga Seamless. <clears throat> we will seamlessly transition here. I'll make sure I share my right screen this time. Hopefully. Uh, so after a morning of looking, uh, uh, I thought I would share this this fun video. Um, you might be able to see it just starting to come in above the treetops here. Pardon me, I didn't realize I swore. Uh, <laughs> But what a absolute treat um, and absolute chaos uh, this uh, this New Year's Day as it was. Um, there's not too many birds that you can just zoom in on your cell phone and still see you know, relevant or, or actual field marks for it. Here were a few of those shots of it uh, coming flying in. Um, even backlit, horrible photo, there's, <laughs> there's no question uh, kind of what you're 
what you're looking at here. Um, sorry, just a few more shots uh, coming in. Clearly, uh, whatever we want to call this, the business end of the bird. Um, and it was really just uh, kind of an amazing experience to get to be there throughout the day. It eventually moved back over. Um, that was just a little further north. Unfortunately, um, on private property, we I'll quickly admit uh, we didn't quite realize. Um, and I'll uh, uh, do all I can right now to say, um, you know, between Booth Bay going over to uh, Five Islands, uh, Georgetown area, you know, regions that I'm sure throughout August uh, are, are used to being inundated with uh, huge numbers of people. We even heard a lobsterman uh, on that New Year's Eve morning make some comment of, you know, that he basically thought it, it, it seemed like an August morning with uh, everyone there. But uh, anyways, I want to say uh, thank you to all the, the locals who kind of uh, allowed Again, hundreds of people to essentially swarm uh, to the area over this this last month. Really, hundreds, uh, truly thousands of people that have been there. Here's just a few fun shots. Um, Sorry, throughout the day on New Year's Eve, um, lots of scopes, lots of cameras. At this point, it was way up on the islands here. Um, this is looking north towards uh, McMahon. Later in the day, out on the dock. Um, it's always fun to turn around and look backwards at, at uh, away from the bird and look at the birders every now and then um, and to see who's aware. Lance and uh, I give a shout out to uh, Camden there for noticing I was doing a panorama. Um, I also want to give a, a shout out to uh, Deirdre Fleming who does a fantastic job covering rare birds in Maine um, in full credit because she after the uh, Stellar Seagull was seen in Massachusetts, she emailed me that day and said, hey, if this bird shows up in Maine, let me know about it. So on the 30th, when we learned about it, we let her know uh, she was up there. Um, uh, excuse me, Bri Brianna, um, the absolutely wonderful photographer, uh, got up there, got some great uh, crowd photos. And Portland Press Herald, uh, New Year's Day front page uh, coverage with the, the Stellar's um, Seagull, which was uh, just pretty awesome. It's really nice to see kind of the uh, level of interest that a bird like this uh, brings up. So it was a fun one to think about from kind of my perspective, working for Maine Audubon, like knowing that this is just gonna be a huge thing and we wanna be able to get as much info out to as many people as possible. Um, we've often done this with some, some rare birds. Folks might remember the red wing, which is a, a type of European thrush that showed up in uh, Kapisic Pond last year. We had a similar doing essentially daily updates. And I know that this blog became uh, I think the, the most visited site on our <laughs> on mainaudubon.org. Um, uh, I'll challenge everyone here, make mainaudubon.org slash donate, the number two most visited site. Um, but anyways, uh, this kind of became the place that every single day uh, we would update this. Um, unfortunately, these last few, uh, last week or so, when there were no sightings, it was not as much fun to update this. So I also want to give a, a huge shout out. Um, I got this started, but then uh, took a little vacation. Um, and Nick, uh, being the great guy he is, while well, I was in areas where it was really hot and there were, I guess, bugs, but hundreds of beautiful tropical birds. Um, while I was there, Nick was keeping this, this updated, um, and I know it was a very useful tool for many people coming to see. We also started a uh, group me, which um, uh, has been fun. It's been interesting. It was kind of the quickest way to get people communicating. Most people just saw this as an app, very pixelated image here, but um, I just wanted to kind of mention this because it was the first time uh, in the state I remember, you know, 
Maine Audubon used to put out a weekly rare bird alert where we would type up, and I used to, uh, before working here, I, I, I volunteered for a while, and one of my duties was to type up that weekly rare bird alert, which um, now with websites like eBird, it's, it's so much easier uh, to find out these sightings. And Maine Audubon, way before that, used to have like a phone number that you would call up and listen to uh, a, a recording each week of what birds were being seen. We've since uh, added things like listserv, so you can email and find out about rare birds. Um, but just knowing the number of people that were going to be interested in this and the uh, efficiency with which we needed to communicate, switching to using a group messaging app um, seemed to be the best way to go. Uh, and, and we basically were looking at Massachusetts had been, had uh, been running one for at least a couple years. And that was one of the best ways that we got the updates, um, as Nick was telling that story, when we went down to look for it, rather than sending these emails that can sometimes be a little uh, slow to send. Um, if you're not already signed up for a listserv, it's, it's almost, it, it can take days sometimes. Um, group me, you can join and be posting immediately. So uh, we're holding around 3,000 members. Uh, over 4,000 people have used the main Rare Bird Alert group me, as, as we're calling it. Um, and I think it's just kind of an amazing one to, to now look at and, and think about this modern day, you know, level of communication that can go on where you can send literally minute by minute updates of where the bird is, who's seeing it, sending pins of where it's uh, sitting. It's uh, uh, pretty cool to kind of think where we are, um, or at least fun to watch the main birding uh, community get up to. I joked, it's, it's essentially, uh, I think it was 2011 or 2012 that group me started. So we're only a, a decade behind, but um, here we are using it. It's also been just really fun to watch uh, reports coming in. Um, it was almost a full month uh, that the bird was uh, seen throughout Maine. And these are just some shots. I, I looked at the, the, the ones that have the highest quality rating of stellar sea eagles in Maine. This is from ebird.org, looking at photos that have been uploaded to the Macaulay Library. Um, and a, a, just a fun note is that if you look at all of the media of stellar seagulls uh, in the Macaulay Library, there's, there's been, uh, as the numbers here say, 2,600 observations, 2,900 photos, but fun to look at it and see that just here in Maine, just in Ebert, there have been uh, 1,200 individual records of the bird. And then of this 2,900 photos in the Macaulay Library, uh, 2,100 of them are of this one Stellar's seagull. And, and I should specify, I did rule out there, uh, we know they've been seen in, in the US before for a while. So this is just beginning in uh, 2021. So maybe there's a few more if we count that 2020 sighting of, uh, of that. But <clears throat> interesting that, Again, you know, I want to essentially drive home that point of like what a we want to call it once in a lifetime opportunity is to see this bird. Uh, to think that there were you know uh, less than eight hundred uh, photos of this of this bird before, and here we've now had thousands more uploaded, um, which is pretty cool. What I thought would be fun to do is kind of answer essentially some of our most common questions about the bird. Um, uh, hopefully to get these out of the way before we also we, we switch over to the um, the Q and A um, and uh, see what other questions people have. Uh, quick shout out to Rob Spears. This was uh, a, a photo I, I wish I had taken. Um, as the bird moved over to Booth Bay, it uh, uh, showed off in some pretty good light for some folks. I did think it'd be fun to look at this map because um, the common question you know, that comes up is like, where has the bird been? Where can I go to see it? Um, and one of the most remarkable things um, is what a tight area this is. So 
looking at the map here for folks that aren't familiar with the area, we've been saying Georgetown and the Five Islands areas essentially right here. Um, on that first day, it was even seen down in, uh, excuse me, from Reed State Park. Interestingly, it made it out to these islands, which we had measured should have looked this up. It was almost like two miles, uh, if not further away, that the bird was perched out on the rocks and we could still, through a spotting scope, still identify it just because of the, truly the mass, the size of it, um, all the way up to uh, MacMahon Island. Um, and I should point out the, the distinction, sorry, there's no key on this, but uh, each of these pins is representing an observation that's been submitted in eBird. The blue pins are records that are over 30 days old, uh, red or orangish pins being within the last 30 days. And then these, um, some of them are bigger because they're designated hotspot within eBird. This is not meant to be an eBird talk, uh, so I won't go into more <laughs> detail than that, but that's just what this is. Um, showing. There's no significance really to the larger or smaller uh, pins. Um, it's worth noting there is this one kind of outlier over here. Um, early on, uh, kind of right at the, the beginning of January, the bird had disappeared for three days and it kind of came in as, as a late report for us. So um, folks didn't uh, know this right away, but there was uh, a person out in Harpswell that on January 3rd photographed uh, the stellar seagull. Absolutely no, no question about the identification of it there. Um, but that's kind of the one outlier that we know of in Maine. Otherwise, this is less than 10 miles as the stellar seagull flies. Uh, anyone who's tried to drive around this area um, knows what a challenge it is to navigate all of our peninsulas here. But um, again, to think like from essentially east to west, this is about 10 miles for a very large bird, uh, a bird of prey that um, will often cover a, a huge area. If anything, I, I do like to point out here that this like really does a good job illustrating, you know, probably what a rich area this is, especially for things like food. Um, if anyone's been here looking at eagles before, bald eagles, um, it's one of the best areas. Maine Audubon every single year does a bald eagles of Merry Meeting Bay cruise. And guess where we go out of? We depart from Booth Bay Harbor, go up the Sheep Scott, all the way up towards, um, oh, excuse me, up uh, cutting across Sassanoa, um, up into uh, Merry Meeting Bay up, up here. Um, so, you know, this is really one of the most eagle dense places in the state of Maine. Um, clearly, you know, I would say in hindsight, no, no surprise that uh, one would show up here. Um, just to zoom out again, uh, Nick essentially showed some of these, these very similar maps, but uh, again, just kind of an interesting one to think about where, where has it been? Where is it going? Um, pretty Actually, can I chime in real quick on that map? You go back to that sort of, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil anything, but uh, so this bird has not been seen since uh, January 24th. So it, it is MIA since then. We don't know if it's in Maine. We don't know where it is. Uh, speaking for myself, I'm not particularly concerned. This bird has shown the ability to take care of itself. It's been, it flies long distances. Um, as some people have been asking, it does appear healthy. It's been feeding. Um, it's lasted several years now outside of Russia or you know the, the, that part of the world and it still looks great. It may be fluffed up in some pictures like, because it's cold as birds do, but it looks healthy. And so um, part of the question is, where is it? Where is it? And Doug, maybe if you go back again, well, um, all of that, look at all that main coast. It could be anywhere in that. All of that is great habitat. All of that is craggly and easy to hide in. Um, all of it has, uh, you know, things that an eagle would like. One thing we have noticed is that it does like to be along rivers near the mouth, you know, where, where they empty into the sea. Um, that was the case on Gaspé 
um, on the Gaspé River and Resigouche. Um, that was the same um, with Falmouth, Nova Scotia, which is there's a sort of an, an inlet there. And so, um, not to jump ahead too much, but if folks, you know, as they are looking, we should continue looking in the places it's been seen, certainly, but also in similar places, which there are a lot of in Maine. But um, uh, you know, not I would not spend a lot of time inland. I would not spend a lot of time on you know islands out to sea necessarily. But um, but Maine's craggly coast. So sorry when I when I saw that map, I had to jump in. No, thank you. Um, I'll just show, uh, especially because there's some amazing uh, footage of this bird. Um, while I answer, there's kind of uh, uh, maybe I'll call them some of the three of the most common uh, questions that come up. Uh, many thanks to Louis Bevier for uh, sharing. Uh, this really awesome footage, it, it, it'll be preening. Um, I'll let this run for a second. Um, kind of as Nick was saying, you know, uh, sorry, the three questions I wanted to get to, as, as Nick was saying, one very common one is people ask, you know, will it survive? As Nick said, like it's in a good area. Um, uh, as we've shown on the map, like it's, you know, it's not Japan, but it's, the habitat's close enough. Um, it's often asked, why is the bird here? Uh, it has wings. It can go where it wants. Uh, I think it's always important to kind of point out, like, this bird got here on its own fruition. Um, there's no reason that we should think that we need to, you know, step in and try to capture it and bring it back to uh, Russia. Like, if it wants to go there, I'm sure it could. Birds are much better at uh, getting where they want to be than, um, excuse me, then <laughs> they know where they want to be. We don't know where they want to be. Um, we can go into this, I guess, a bit more if, if people do have the questions, but a common theory with a lot of uh, vagrancy that occurs is that they are birds prospecting, whether it's looking for like a new area that they're going to um, breed or even just maybe survive the winter. So there's lots of reasons um, uh, why it might be going around. The only other one I wanted to uh, quickly answer was uh, the question of boy or girl. And people often say, you know, it's been nicknamed Stella. I guess a play on stellar. Um, we don't know if it's male or female. Uh, females are larger. That's true of almost all raptors. Um, Huge shout out to Doug Gottschfeld for this incredible slow motion footage of our bird in flight. Um, really quite stunning. Um, so we don't know if it's male or female. A lot of vagrants tend to be young males, but again, we know this is a, an adult bird. Um, so that kind of goes right out the window. Um, I've heard people argue about like the size of the bill and, and things, but I think it's it's much safer for us to all just say, we don't know, boy or girl. I did want to kind of wrap up and especially thinking about this idea of um, uh, vagrants and what, you know, what happens to them. Um, one that's often pointed out is people ask about the great black hawk. That was kind of the other famous rare bird that uh, has recently shown up in Maine uh, in 2018, actually. And this goes all the way back to um, April of 2018, Alex Lamoureux photographed this great black hawk that you're seeing the picture of now in South Padre Island, Texas in April. That was the first time one had ever been seen in the US, pretty, uh, pretty amazing. Um, you got these nice shots of it. Fast forward from April to August when it was found at Fortune's Rocks um, down near Biddeford. Uh, August 8th, was seen for a couple days, uh, much like Nick explained, looking at that essentially fingerprint of, of these birds. This is an amazing thing that we can do nowadays with, uh, especially with, with digital uh, photography being um, so easy to take so many shots. And again, we could match up, you know, almost feather by feather, looking at uh, especially some of these little primary coverts, um, the patterns match up uh, perfectly. So. Uh, again, a really cool way that we can kind of track these, these birds, birds as individuals, I think is the term that's often used. Um, 
Snepper had, had disappeared from Biddeford uh, in August, but eventually in November showed up in Deering Oaks Park. And that's where it then stayed for a couple months um, and delighted many a birders. I should put a content warning up. If you're squeamish to uh, torn open pigeons, maybe look away from your screen for a minute. But um, what I wanted to point out here is like, Spoiler, if anyone doesn't know, the great black hawk didn't fare well in Maine. This is truly a, a tropical species. Um, uh, Beautio gallus, that, that group of, of these hawks, like the crab eating hawks, notice they have those long bare legs, like not exactly the best thing to have if you're gonna try to survive the Maine winter. Um, and we know it eventually did um, succumb to, to frostbite. But while it was here, it kept coming back to Deering Oaks. It would be chased away by uh, a local red-tailed hawk, but kept coming back into the park. So again, from this idea of like, who are we to essentially step in? Like that bird knew where it wanted to be. It was finding prey. Folks might remember that was the year of the squirrel Mageddon when there were dead squirrels all over the place. And this bird ate a ton of squirrels. Uh, it stole pigeons uh, from cook from the local Cooper's hawks that would catch them. Um, anyways, kind of amazing to see like this history, this, this pattern, uh, you know, sorry, twice is not a pattern, twice is a coincidence, but there, there is a pattern of uh, raptors as vagrants um, and we're very lucky to have them here in Maine. The last point I'll, I'll quickly make is that we have birds that survive long time, a very long time as vagrants. So, while that great black hawk uh, ultimately didn't have a um, uh, uh, very nice ending to it. Um, a lot of folks know this, there's a red-billed tropic bird, which as the name implies, it should be down in the tropics, not here in Maine. But last year was the 17th consecutive year that this red-billed tropic bird has returned to islands off of um, uh, kind of the mid-coast area. So Seal Island is where it's uh, most famously been uh, coming for the last number of years. As a fun fact, the oldest known, by banding and keeping track of it, the oldest known red-billed tropic bird is, was, I think, 17 years and seven months old. So this bird coming back to Maine for 17 years, if it comes back next year, it will be the oldest known tropic bird, um, at least no, known to us. Um, which that tells you something about vagrancy. Like it's, it's, uh, uh, it's not a death sentence for all these birds. It tells you something about not having to raise kids either, you know, not having to worry about a mate. <laughs> you're just, you're just living your life. And Doug, and we got to get to questions. Sounds great. All right. We got to get to questions. Thanks everybody. Uh, put your questions in the Q and A. Doug, I'm going to give you the one that we've had uh, several times. Valentine's Day is coming up. What are the chances that this stellar sea eagle will find a bald eagle mate and produce and do something? Yeah, it's almost like I was going to be prepared to. Oh, show look at this guy. Um, so, we're, worth noting, I'll give the, the very quick answer is I don't think it's going to find a bald eagle and mate with it. Um, there's, there's no truly documented uh, breeding records of bald eagles and stellar sea eagles, but it's worth noting that there is this one um, from Birding Magazine, the ABA's uh, American Birding Association's publication in 2008, as this um, interesting article that, that basically was trying to decipher uh, this bird. This is from um, some, some screen grabs. We're looking at you know a bald eagle kind of in the foreground here, and it's this younger bird that's kind of in question. And I'll let people go read the article if you want to. It's an interesting one um, where they basically look at the, the field marks of this bird. It's clearly huge, has a large yellow bill. Um, it's got field marks of a stellar seagull and it has field marks of a bald eagle. It, it has field marks that don't match pure individuals of, of each. So I would say, you know, it would probably be a little tedious, but there were me. In parentheses, with every single one of these, I would have said, you know, presumed hybrid. Um, <laughs> there was a bald eagle that was paired up 
uh, paired that was seen associating kind of with a, uh, excuse me, a bald eagle with a stellar seagull that um, I think it was going on 10 years that they were essentially together in Alaska. No known uh, offspring that came from that. So yeah, if you're a stellar seagull in Maine in the summertime, um, maybe, you know, uh, uh, you could share a nest. Um, but I would say that that's, that's such a rare thing. Um, it's, it's, uh, it would only be presumed at this time that it's, I think, ever happened. So uh, maybe. You know, I'm a bit more of a romantic and I, I think it is going to, you know, and actually this gets to a really interesting question that it's sort of a, a, a parallel line of thinking that has followed the eagle is how do we, what do we, how do we think about this bird, this individual? Do we think of it as a, a lost bird who's missing his home and desperately sad to return or maybe doomed to live a life of solitude? Or do we think about this bird as an explorer, as a bird out on its own, you know, charting a new path for its species or living its best life somewhere in a new continent? You know, there is no right or wrong answer, but the right answer is the happy one. We've got enough bad stuff going on and it's been a tough enough two years we don't need to be sad by this we should be happy by this this bird got here on its own it's thriving as they say um uh you know i i don't know whether it's happy or not i don't know if it experiences happiness but it's eating it's uh flying around and so um you know the experience that so many people have put on our kudos board or I've heard from people who've seen the eagle is, is joy, right? Seeing, nobody thought they would see this uh, bird and to see it is just, it's a, it's a miracle almost. And so um, whether or not it mates, whether or not it gets back to Russia, which is, which is very unlikely, um, uh, it's fine. It, 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 it's here and it's living its life and it's, it, it will associate with bald eagles um, it'll, uh, it'll make its way in the world. I'm, I'm pretty confident it's got this far. So um, let's get to a few more questions. Wes, our seven-year-old, um, said, how much bigger than a bald eagle is it? We didn't cover this. So um, stellar eagles are related to bald eagles. Um, they are uh, Haliaetus eagles, uh, along with white-tailed eagles and some others. Um, they're about a foot longer each way and up to about five pounds heavier. That may not sound like much, but it this it's a big, this is when you see this and you see bald eagles near it, you're like, that is bigger and that's a bigger bird. Um, so the stellar seagull, um, you know, there are uh, often bald eagles like, you know, harassing it or, or around and they're all, they like, like look like little gnats compared to uh, the stellar eagle. So thanks, Wes. Um, I think it's twice the mass. You know, the size is always tough. To judge but when you see like the uh, uh not that we're out there weighing birds but um it's significant yeah hannah asks uh is it strictly a fish eater it is not um it'll eat fish it's been seen um eating ducks have you ever figured out what kind of duck that was doug um black duck probably yeah, I don't remember. I, I feel like someone at one point was saying that you could see. Um, oh, goose, Canada goose. Yeah. They thought it was, right. Um, it eats meat. My friend Jake Walker in Nova Scotia, he went down to the area uh, where the bird is hanging out after it had left, and there was a deer carcass there um, that appeared to have been fed on. It's, the, the stellar seagull did not take down a deer, um, but, it, but it may have fed on that as well. I, but it could have. It could have. Um, so, um, so no, it is not strictly a fish eater. Um, let's see, what impact has it had on local bald eagles? Doug? Yeah, I would <laughs> say all the hard ones to Doug. <laughs> not much. Um, you know, we, as I said earlier, we've seen a bit of that, uh, kleptoparasitism. It's, it's been seen chasing after and, and attempting to steal prey, um, from a few bald eagles, but uh, it really, um, it's not having any impact on them. Like it's not uh, uh, predating them. Um, so <laughs> quick answer, L little, to, little to no impact. Uh, obviously inserting an, a new predator into an area is um, going to have some impact, but um, again, that's such a 
dense area of eagles already. Um, that I don't think having uh, one more slightly larger uh, uh, would be that big of a problem. Um, someone asked, uh, who's Steller? Uh, well, George Wilhelm Steller was a German naturalist explorer, spent a lot of time in Alaska, um, and did well for himself in terms of things being named for him. You may have heard of Steller's J, Steller's CEO, right? It's not a Steller Eagle. <laughs> Doug's bringing the memes. Um, <laughs> for all the kids uh, out there. Steller's, Steller's J, Steller's Eider, Steller's Sea Cow, big extinct um, uh, manatee relative there. Um, so uh, that's who Steller was. Not Steller, although it is a, it is a um, enticing homonym there for that, that one. Um, I want to, sorry, if, there, if I can take a second. The fun, nope. the, another fun one was, um, it was, if I get the name right, I've always said this wrong. Um, Peter Simon uh, Paya or Palas, Palas, P-A-L-L-A-S. Mm -hmm. Um, he was the one to name it after uh, Stellar, or it was like the first one to uh, describe it, I, I guess, which people might know like Pala's Gull or uh, Pala's Bunting. Um, and there's a wonderful um, quote, uh, uh, I'll, I'll, Michael Tucker sent this to me, but it's from, if people go on All About Birds, Cornell's website, um, they do some great posts, the people behind uh, excuse me, the people behind the birds named for people is the, uh, the series. And there's a wonderful quote um, in it. It says, four years and just one major expedition, expedition later, Seller died of a fever in 1746. In his 37 years, he was the first European to communicate with Alaskan natives um, and certainly the first to offer them brandy. He never returned to Germany or saw his wife again, having, quote, quite forgotten her and fallen in love with nature. <laughs> it's just like his eagle. Um, and I do recognize that at 7.30, that is our hour. I I'm good to keep going for a little bit. Doug, I don't know about you. Um, if folks have places they need to be, I get it. If not, hang out. Um, Matthew Dallet asks, does it vocalize? It does indeed vocalize. And um, some of the audio that uh, was ca that Marshall Iliff captured in Massachusetts um, was vocalizations and and you know pretty amazing to capture Stellar Sea Eagle vocalizing in uh, in New England. Um, it doesn't sound like much. Doug, are you pulling up an audio file? Is that what I hear? Yeah. Cool. Let's see if we, yeah. Sorry, I'll stall for time. You know, uh, bald eagles are not known for their uh, you know. Uh, impressive vocal range, particularly. I have actually insulted them on several occasions. Um, but um, let's see if we can get a call. Yes, they vocalize typically, you know, um, probably less common in the winter than in the breeding range. Here we go. Sorry, I hope this sounds okay. Uh, listen carefully, but this is this was actually Marshall's recording from Massachusetts. Sorry if that sounded a little harsh coming through the, the computer, but almost like a little like um, kind of uh, uh, continuous barking. It almost has like a, a woodpecker quality to it, if you ask, ask me. Uh, certainly not like the, uh, not like a bald eagle, which kind of sound like giggling at times. Right, but. laughing. A couple of folks in the chat asked about whether we or someone is planning on capturing it and tagging it or putting um, trackers on it. You know, that is not something that I advocate for, that I mean, Audubon is advocating for. You know, we could learn things potentially from this. It would be hard to know exactly, you know, other than our interest in exactly where it is at all times. Um, you know, my, I, I don't, I'm not interested in doing that. I want this bird to live wild and free and uh, free of uh, human interference to the extent we can. Um, so, um, it, 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 you know, it, it's also an interesting question too of who sort of is in charge of this bird. You know, this bird got here on its own. Um, who, who, you know, says yay or nay about 
what can or should be done with it. It's, it's um, you know, the federal government, you know, has a say in it, certainly, but um, it's hard to know. So I don't want to see that happen. I want this bird to to live its life. Doug, do you have thoughts about that question? I guess the only thing I'll add, because it, it, I feel like it's often just like thrown out there and um, uh, not to say I, I don't know the background of anyone who um, who suggests it, but it's often a lot harder than people realize, like not only to, to capture the bird and, and ban it, but like, um, how do you capture, you know, a massive eagle um, and do it without putting the bird under a ton of stress? Um, so there's, I'll throw that out there just to say like, there's a lot of reasons to not do it. Um, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, and that's why we would essentially take the perspective of um, not seeing much value. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning like, you know, there's some amazing tracking technology that can be used nowadays, but like for a lot of these, a lot of birds that are like banded, like the recapture rate is so low that um, when you start balancing like what you're gonna learn versus like the potential um, harm, uh, it often doesn't kind of uh, balance out. Yeah. Um, similar question sort of about whether any genetic material has been um, taken from this bird. Um, my understanding is that no, you could, if you were able to, to get a, a dropped feather or uh, some poop, you could um, study that uh, and learn some information. Um, you know, my understanding that it is, uh, you know, DNA labs are sort of have, they're up to their arms and maybe perhaps more important uh, work than that with crimes or something. Um, so in theory, we could do it. And I'd be very interested in, in if we could, you know, if there was a, a, something obtained safely. Um, Doug, what do you think? Um, I guess the question would be like, what, what would we learn? Um, you know, we know it's a stellar seagull. It's a, it's a pure looking stellar seagull. There's no reason to suspect there's any like mixed genealogy. Um, uh, I don't know a ton about the like stable isotope analysis that could be done, but my hunch is that like the bird's been in the U.S. long enough, maybe molted enough feathers that like, uh, I don't know. That can often be a thing where you can look at like, what has it been eating? Um, essentially to figure out like where it's been, but where it's been so long. Um, I don't know, we're getting outside of my level of expertise. So I'll say, you know, if anyone sees it dropping a feather, uh, sure, let us <laughs> get it. Yeah. Uh, don't cross contaminate it and uh, get it to us. Um, uh, but don't try to get a feather. <laughs> put it that way please don't yeah leave the just leave him alone or her alone um i'll take i'll do two more questions one from christine here do you know if many studies have been done on this species in russia and japan yes lots of uh this is a heavily studied bird it's uh, being protected to the extent possible uh it, the conservation needs to improve uh for the species from a number of its threats doug mentioned um lead uh shot um, this is a problem for stellars but also bald eagles um, lead gets into, uh, into eagles when um, lead shot is used to shoot a deer um, and uh, the, the bullet fragments stay in the, in the, um, the you know, parts of the deer that are left out once it's cleaned. Um, eagles will come down and eat that and get lead in them. It doesn't take much for them to, um, to get sick. Um, Maine Audubon is uh, working to encourage the, the use of um, non-lead shot in Maine and elsewhere, and uh, that would certainly help. Um, habitat fragmentation is also, and, and habitat sort of um, loss is, is a threat for cellar sea eagles as well in its, in its home range. Um, but Summit also asks, since it's not local, is this bird protected under any American laws? I mean, we were just talking about that earlier. Um, it is indeed listed on the, um, a, as a protected species under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, uh, which um, we, we were wondering about because typically that act only covers North American species. Um, but this bird has been in North America enough times in Alaska that it um, is, has received, does receive official um, recognition and protection under that act. And so um, that would mean that any attempts to uh, harass it or takes, et cetera, um, are prohibited under that, uh, under that act. So we're watching it, everybody, if you're going after it. Um, 
So uh, uh, just one final thing, this is being recorded. We will, we will put it on YouTube for, uh, for sharing later. Um, Doug, any last words? Um, I'll make the quick plug to say thank you again to all the uh, locals that have been putting up with mobs of birders. Um, and, and the one thing I, I try to keep getting across to, to folks is that I hope this can be a spark bird for, for many people. So while there's so many unknowns about, you know, what's going to happen to it, you know, where is it going from here? Um, and there's one thing I've been encouraging folks is, you know, uh, bring someone out to see it. Uh, it's been amazing to, to kind of see the, the amount of interest. Obviously, it's, it's a large, charismatic uh, eagle, but I think this bird has helped turn a lot of folks onto birding. Um, I spoke with a guy who he came into Maine Audubon after seeing the bird because he wanted to buy a scope. And it was just <laughs> such a funny, like, you know, one of the first birds he went out to see was the stellar sea eagle had such it's a good great time. one and, and it's been awesome to see people like sharing their scopes when it's sitting far out um and he was like this is it this is my new hobby um and you know i feel like you're you're kind of starting at the top there uh but birding is ac absolutely a wonderful hobby pastime career uh everyone should be at least casual birders amen I want to thank Melissa and Jen for manning the back end here, helping us out with this and, and getting everybody signed up. This was great. Everybody, like, keep your eyes open. If you're, if you're anywhere on the main coast, anywhere near a river, anywhere from Florida to Iceland, keep your eyes open for this bird. Let's find it. Let's share the love some more. Um, everybody have a great evening and thanks for joining us.